helps me fill your mind with spooky, true crime stories of the deranged, unhinged, and absolute pure evil murders that will blow your mind. Some places you will visit to show you around and educate you on the history. Other times we will bring you to the paranormal because the dead never lie silent for too long. It'll be the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has us, but we're gonna get something killed. Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, Buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Hi, welcome everyone. We're back. We are. We're gonna be doing part two that we started in last week's episode, even though we're still in the same outfit. We probably should have did a fake change of um outfit but we're actually recording this all in one day because gina yeah. is here with us so yes still here still on zoom sorry for the audio we'll get there i promise <laughs> yes so but um we're going to be doing part two the most haunted places in america because if you haven't known us from before i love history gina loves creepy scary abandoned places so we like yeah. to talk about this stuff and we both are into true crime and this kind of has it all in a lot of yeah. these places. Yeah. It's like, you know, I don't know. So many people have asked what fascinates you about abandoned places? Like, do you just want to go there to see ghosts? Do you just want to go? And it's like, that is not it at all. What's your number reason why you like to visit abandoned places? A lot of the abandoned places that I have visited have been asylums and, and stuff like that. And, you know, creepier places, but there's something so nostalgic even if you were to visit like an abandoned mall it's like a time capsule where there's so much history inside the walls that's why it kills me that like so many things are are torn down and I get it like they can't stay there forever but there's just something so nostalgic about walking in and being somewhere and knowing that like in this room that I'm standing in this is where people used to come to be treated. And this is where they did surgery on people. And and in your case, this is where Richard Ramirez slept and dreamt. This yeah. is when you yeah. went to go sleep in the same room that Richard Ramirez slept in. You're right. <laughs> yeah. At this people. hotel, like there's just so much that has happened, whether it's good or bad. Like there's just so many things that have happened in those walls that it's just, it's so interesting to me. I don't know why. I think it echoes through time. Like, I don't know what, what you feel, but I feel like it's almost like different. And I'm going to sound corny and saying it because it's, you don't see it, it, but it's almost like different dimensions of time when you step into places like that. And it's so quiet and it is abandoned and there's not noise to cancel it out, but it feels like you can almost touch history you can almost see what they were doing, feel what they're doing. That's why I really like not even abandoned places, like places that they have kept up museums, you know, frontiers that we visited. What were they called? The forts, you forts. know, the United Fort States Bridger and yes. And you go there and you see the history and you see where these people lived. But my biggest fascination with abandoned places, and it's not even like the fascination of it. And almost where you kind of touched on it, where it's so sad that they're going to demolish it. I just want to document that it was there. I want to yeah. see before it goes. Yeah. Because I one day all this stuff is just going to be gone. Yeah. Like, it's it's not gone. Even, just like they say that there were civilizations that lived before us, you, you know, you see the, the broken brick and mortar and they try to piece together these villages in these towns and these cities that these people lived in thousands of years ago and what were they like and that's eventually going to be us in our history people are going to yeah. come and be like what were these people like who were they based on what we left behind and it's going to be so much better because we have the technology to document it now like we didn't back then like the history books in like 70 80 90 years are going to be off the chain, man. Those things are going to be popping. They're going to be like the Harry Potter pictures where they're, ooh, look at the moving pictures. We almost have that anyways with our iPhone cameras exactly. when we have pictures on live, you know? 
Yeah, so exactly. We are going to take a trip to the town of Villisca, Iowa. I hope I'm saying that right. If there's anybody that lives there, please let us know. <laughs> Sometimes we're not too sure if we say these towns yeah. correctly. Yes, towns, names, all of that stuff. So please let us know. So on June 9th, 1912, one evening, an entire family was murdered. Eight people in the home, Josiah B. Moore, 43, his wife, Sarah, 39, their four children, Herman, 11, Mary Catherine, 10, Arthur, 7, Paul, 5, and Mary Catherine's two young guests, Ina, age 8, and Lena Stillinger, age 12, were killed by blunt force trauma to their heads from an axe. Josiah Moore was a leading Villisca businessman, and the Stillinger sisters, Ina May and Lena Gertrude, were daughters of a wealthy farmer living a few miles from Villisca. I that just want to say before, how many of these cases have we covered where it's so sad that a child, like a neighbor's child was there? Yeah. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong time. It's just so heartbreaking. That you know, massacre, right? the the one that was in chino hills yes yeah so and i and other ones where you know there's one we the ones we haven't even covered where when they went camping and they had a friend stay over it was in a cabin and i don't even know the names of that one because we haven't covered it yet but i remember the story where they had a friend staying over or the one where the mom took her daughter and her daughter's best friend on a trip and mm -hmm. Three of them ended up missing and, and it's scary you just you yeah. never know you have to be so careful and so. you don't want to keep your kids locked up but at the same time like how do you not you know i'm i would be terrified especially in this in this world we're living in right now i would not be wanting to raise little kids no. mm -mm. so that evening the visiting girls and the moore family attended the presbyterian church where they participated in the children's day program which Sarah had coordinated. After the program ended at 9.30 p.m., the Moores and the Stillinger's sisters walked to the Moores' house, arriving between 9.45 and 10 p.m. At 7 a.m. the next day, a neighbor, Mary Peckman, became concerned after she heard the horses neighing in the barn and noticed that the family had not come out to do their morning chores. She knocked on the door, and when no one answered, she tried to open it. The door was locked from the inside, so she called Josiah's brother, Ross Moore. He, bought, he brought over a copy of the house key, and when he received no response from the family, he unlocked the front door and let himself in. Ross went into the parlor and opened the guest bedroom door, where he found Ina and Lena Stillinger's bodies on the bed. Moore immediately told Mary Peckman to call Henry, or Hank Morton, Villisca's primary officer, Horton's search of the house revealed that the entire Moore family and the two Stillinger girls had been bludgeoned to death. The murder weapon and axe belonging to Josiah was found in the guest room where the Stillinger sisters were found. Strangely, every window and mirror in the house were covered with linens. Doctors concluded that the murders took place between midnight and 5 a.m. Yeah, I would imagine that's a lot of people to kill. Yeah. That's eight people in one yeah. home. Yeah. You wonder how that happens. It has been suggested that the killer waited patiently in the attic until the family was asleep. The killer went after Josiah and Sarah first, who were sleeping in the master bedroom. Josiah received more blows from the axe than any other victim. His face had been cut to such an extent that his eyes were missing, suggesting that he was the intended target. The ceiling in his room had also a gouge mark from where the murderer lifted the axe to murder him. Oh, wow. That's how much force he put behind force. it. Oof. And also the reason why they think that the perpetrator waited in the attic is because some accounts, they said that there were cigarette butts found in the attic, but on other accounts, they said, no, there were no cigarette butts. But that's the theory is that somebody was up there waiting yeah. was waiting for them to come in. I mean, yeah. that would that would make the most sense. Yeah. So the killer used the blade of an axe on Sarah while using the blunt end on the rest of the victims, 
Herman, Mary Catherine, Arthur, and Paul were bludgeoned next in the head in the same manner as their parents. Afterwards, the murderer returned to the master bedroom to inflict more blows to the elder Moors, knocking over a shoe that had filled with blood. Oh, my God. He started with the parents. He went back to the kids, and then he went back to the parents. I'm trying to figure out, is it because, did he hear them moaning? Were they not? Gonna say, maybe they were, yeah, I'm, that would make sense. Yes. Yeah. He then moved downstairs to the guest bedroom where Lena and Ina were sleeping. Ina was struck first with the ax, which, which woke up Lena. Lena tried to move away on the bed and fight back. She was found with a defensive wound on her arm. Seemingly afterwards, a four pound slab of bacon was taken out of the ice box and laid next to the ax. Very interesting. Investigators also found untouched food and bloody water during the search. After the search, people were let into the house, which completely contaminated the evidence. After a lengthy investigation, with one suspect being tried twice, resulting in an acquittal, no one has been found guilty of the crime. However, nine months before the murders at Villisca, a similar case of axe murder occurred in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Two axe murder cases followed in Ellsworth, Kansas and Paola, Kansas. The cases were similar enough to raise the possibility of having been committed by the same person. And in one of the places, they actually, you know how they had found linen uh, covering the windows yeah. and mirrors? I mean, they had found it at an, one of the other places as well. So it was very similar how the crime scene was set up. Right. To me, this is me trying to be an investigator. And I do have to say the one where I said, where it was said like the intended target, um, it appears he was the intended target. Um, that was my conclusion. Just saying, because <laughs> I'm being the investigator here. I'm solving crimes left and right. But hey. no, just because Just because the first one, or it was the fact that maybe he was attacked so viciously and hard because he would be the one person to try to stop if he was the one who woke up, you know, hearing the crime being committed. So either way, I'm looking I mean, at it. That's kind of like overkill too. Yeah. I feel like, and then he went back to them. Like, I feel like there was some kind of personal vengeance. On yeah. this. Like I, maybe he's a businessman who did a transaction that somebody didn't like. I always wonder too, if these things would have happened today with the technology that we have today, DNA, the forensic capability, like all of that, I wonder how quickly these cases would have been solved. Well, I'll just say the ax would not be a murder weapon of choice. No. It's just, it's bizarre. It's a, and yeah. the sad part is, is that eight people died and no one's gone to jail. But the one person that they did try twice on actually admitted to killing the family. They, But they didn't trust his admission. They were saying that he's just crazy. He was just saying it to say it to get the attention. There I mean, was no proof that he was the one who committed the crime. But yet he was going around saying it was him, but he ended up getting acquitted for the crime. So, and things were so different back then, you know, like it was just such a different world back then. And I know that all this place, this stuff still took place back then. Like, I really don't think that we'll see many more serial killers just because of technology. Anytime you're anywhere, you, you have to basically just think that you're being recorded because you probably are. They can follow your footsteps everywhere. So if you want to start, like, I can see starting out, like, yes, I'm going to be a serial killer, but you're going to get caught before you're actually technically a serial killer. Going to get there. Yeah. Yeah. You're never going to make it to you're that. Never gonna, no. But mm -hmm. I think that's why we don't have that slow growth of killing. We have that. I'm going to go into a nightclub and just shoot as many mass people kill. as possible yeah, mass yeah. in one time. And, and by no means is this a challenge for anybody to no. try <laughs> No, I'm not no. challenging anybody. But you do see the change in how these, like, okay, back then, axe murder, knives, poison, you know, here, now, you know, then it moved to like serial killing slowly over a course of time. Now it's just, yeah. you know, you're one and done. 
you know, just get it all done at one time, which is sad. Yeah, it's terrible. Because they think they're thinking, I can't do this over time. So therefore I'll just get do it all blood in my hands. Mm -hmm. They're keeping up with the technology, which is really sad. It's, it's terrible. Really sad. Yeah, yeah. And you see the world changing. So, yeah. but here we are with another happy episode from Shannon and Gina at 50 States of Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> way to make the people happy we are another happy week <laughs> yeah it's really sad when you're talking about children and a whole entire family and you're just talking a whole entire generation wiped out eight people in one whole family wiped out yeah, yeah definitely and this is this is somewhere where we you can visit or no yes oh yeah no you can go to this home they turned it into a museum and you can stay the night so it welcomes guests yeah. Every single one of these places we are going to be talking about welcomes guests. I wonder like how long, cause you know, like when we did like the Polly Bartlett thing, I'm going to go back to Polly Bartlett again, which was our very first episode we ever recorded. Yes. So I wonder when this story like originated, is there any history of like, cause they had newspapers back then. Was it in the newspaper? Was there yes, any- That's when you actually have the family. Like, uh, not like Sally that we talked about last week where we don't have proof. We just have a sketch of what she might look like. Right. This one actually has the family, the photos of the family, everything. Yes. Okay. So this one, there is documentation that this did take place. And this house actually changed hands a few times and people had a hard time staying there because they actually said that it is right. haunted as well. Yeah. And it's a place with paranormal activity. So um, not too many people stayed there. Until finally a guy purchased the home and said, hey, I'm going to restore it back to a time that it looked like back then with no plumbing, no electricity. However, it was done back then. Yeah. And we have people um, visit it and turn it into like a bed and breakfast or some kind of hotel where people could stay. <laughs> Kids died in this home. Mm -hmm. And now it's this bed and breakfast where you can go and do paranormal investigations and they turn it into this whole museum where people are paying money to see this. Yeah. And tragedy happened there so in our day and age how long in the future would it be okay for us to turn that home into a museum where we can go and do ghost investigations so to me it is kind of a little strange and I'm kind it of is. loving history but you know kind of at a crossroads where is this really okay for us to do well that's just like should we should we buy the Watts house and turn it into a museum Thank you. That's, we were joking about that, but you know, but I told Shannon, we should buy it and we should just move over there and start recording our, our podcast from there. Your content creator home, but yeah, things like that. And, and you know, we kind of joke about it, but the truth is people died in those, these homes. Yeah. So when, when is it even okay? You know, and that goes back to what we talked about in the episode last week is like when people ask me what is so fascinating about this and why do you like serial killers and why are you so interested in true crime and like don't you think that you know it's it's not good to be talking about these things and it's that it's um disrespectful to the families and like why would you why would you buy a t-shirt with Richard Ramirez on it why would you you know what I mean like and I get it I get that part of it but at the same time, it's just absolutely fascinating to me. Oh, yeah. I, that's funny you said that because I was just on the website for what we're going to talk about next week is our Lizzie Borden is, um, and I was looking at her t-shirts for sale in the gift shop. So online. Yeah, <clears throat> so, yeah it's in, and just our, you know, us going to the Branch Davidian and getting exactly. it from there, you know, that was like. A, a absolute massacre that took place there exactly. Pregnant women, children like everything so honestly I would like people's opinion I mean if you think it's just absolutely hideous that we even do it and you know put it down there I mean say it respectfully of course you know yeah. we do value people's opinion and what they think about it but what but our argument is you know if we don't talk about it like they say, history repeats itself. Yeah. Things don't get corrected. You forget what you did that was wrong in the past. I'm curious to see, because I get asked the question a lot, especially when people find out like, oh, you do a podcast? What do you do your podcast on? And I always like 
when I say like true crime or, you know, stuff like that, I always wait to see people's response and like the look on their face, like what they're going to say or how they're going to act. Because I mean, truth be told, there's hundreds of thousands of millions of people who are into true crime. But at the same time, there's a lot of people who aren't. And who, who hate the fact that people cover true crime. I mean, obviously, everybody, anybody that's listening to our show is a fan of, of it. But I'm still curious to see, like, you know, how people feel about, like, what what is too much? What is, what is going too far? Because, exactly. you know, like, Shannon and I, when we, especially when we were in Texas, like, we went okay. to the, candy, the Candyman's house, who was a serial killer. We, you know um Andrea Yates house you know we did all that stuff and some people are like why would you do that yeah. and and I get it like I absolutely get it however I guess I'm just that person yeah I'm just fascinated by it because it's just fascinating to me and I don't know why again I just feel like it's I don't know I'm gonna just I'm gonna blame my mom <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> because yeah. my mom is the one from when I was little that like always watched the shows and was just always into that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know if that's necessarily where I got it from, but it had to have been, I don't know really where else I would have. The curiosity, the, yeah. the getting into the mind of these people, what in the world are they thinking? And we're actually a lot of the crime and take you back to the candy man you had to do some of those episodes because it's really hard for me to talk about children yeah and children who are tortured and young men and women and it's it, sometimes it gets really really hard but i still want to know why like yeah. what would take a person to that point especially that when we went to um when we went to the killing fields Yes. A lot of people ask me, like, why would you go there? Like, why do you, why do you want to go there? Why do you want to go to number one, like safety wise? Why would you, why would you put yourself in that position? Yeah. Why would you go there? But second of all, why would you want to visit somewhere where all these people were horrifically killed and murdered and their bodies just left there? Like, what I don't know can somebody answer that for me because I don't know why I don't know why myself <laughs> sometimes we're, we're a little bit perplexed by our interest yeah but. I don't know but I think it's a it's a good question to throw out there um but yeah just you know don't 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 come at us hard and just be or nice what, or what interests you like what part of it why are you interested in it because we are going to have people here that are fans and why are you interested so please yeah. put it in the comments so we can read them so yeah but thanks again for joining us on another week. Yeah. And we really appreciate your loyalty, our new subscribers, the people who keep coming back. Thank yeah. you so much. You know, we just really enjoy doing this and putting this out there for you guys. And we're really happy that you enjoy listening to us. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. And we've, speaking of comments, we've gotten so many nice comments. Like we, we really, really appreciate you guys. Um, like I said, right now, I'm not able to answer many comments, but please know that they are being read and like, we really, really, really appreciate all of you guys uh, watching, listening, however you, however you get to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we will see you guys again next week. Have a great week. Bye.